So, um, very warm welcome again. Uh, my name is Bente Knoll. I'm um, a landscape planner and transport planner, and I'm self-employed. I am managing director um, of a landscape architecture company, as well as um, consultancy, BNK. Uh, my company is located in Vienna. And I'm also working as um, a freelancer lecturer at the Technical University in Vienna. And my main fields of interest are gender studies uh, in engineering in general and focusing mobility issues. And let me also introduce my co-trainer for today, uh, which is Emilia Rossi. Emilia, would you like to present yourself? Sure. Um, yes, I'm a gender specialist who's uh, mostly active within the international development sector and I also my main areas of interest are gender in the economy and care work and especially gender and development in the global south I am based here in Italy and Bologna and they'll be uh, supporting the training today with Bente. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the training for today, Gender Dimension in Research, Mobility, is uh, one of the trainings that um, have been developed under a European funded project, uh, GE Academy, Gender Equality Academy. And uh, let's hear a little bit about the GE Academy. As some of you may, might know already, the GE Academy is our Horizon 2020 project. So it's aimed at disseminating knowledge about gender equality in, in academia. Um, so these are the main aims that it has. So it, in principle, wants to develop and implement a coherent and high quality capacity building program in research and innovation on gender equality in research and innovation. It is also based on state-of-the-art knowledge and expertise, uh, and it provides tailor-made training material. As you may have seen on the web page, there are different formats. So uh, currently, in-person is not uh, happening, but it is one of the usual options for in-person and online trainings. There are workshops, webinars, summer schools, as well as DOCCs. And target groups include uh, researchers as well as decision makers and HR officers, among others. And if you want to check the trainings that are coming up, you can look at the web page and they're all listed there, as you might know already. So, and about the training today, we have um, um, a specific target group. So it's uh, a training that is um, tailored for uh, people who are on one hand um, working as researchers and as scholars, um, mainly in the STEM field, um, and today also focusing the mobility um, topic. And um, it's also um, a training that is uh, targeted for people who are responsible in their organizations, um, in research performing organizations or research funding organizations, uh, when they do support and uh, consultancy for the researchers who apply for um, European funds or also for national funds. Um, let me just briefly give you a short uh, overview about the Zoom technicalities, uh, but I'm pretty sure that we all know about um, the uh, functionalities of muting and unmuting um, ourselves. And as um, we have a very small group today, um, I would really also invite you to uh, switch on your camera and whenever there are um, yeah, things to be discussed, then please um, feel free and unmute you yourself. So I guess uh, for the training today, we won't use the chat uh, function that um, then. So it would be also nice to um, have a talk with you and uh, um, hear about your expectations and so on and your contributions. Um, the agenda for today, um, we will um, have a short introduction and overview. And then um, we would like to invite you to um, undertake a reflection um, about your individual mobility patterns. We have um, prepared um, 
several uh, working documents for you. I will explain that later. And we would like to start really with an um, self-reflection exercise, um, which will hopefully help you to um, yeah, rethink about your own mobility patterns. Uh, and then uh, we will have um, an input uh, concerning travel survey methods, results uh, concerning the gender perspective in mobility issues. And we will also um, discuss about uh, different um, specific target groups and their mobility patterns and their uh, mobility um, needs and wishes. And then uh, we will uh, have a group work where you are um, also invited to um, step in somebody else's shoes uh, and reflect on specific needs and requirements, um, different user groups, different vulnerable user group, groups may have uh, concerning uh, their mobility solutions or uh, what would it be about uh, inclusive mobility solutions. Um, after the group work, we will have um, a short coffee break uh, and then a sum up of uh, the results of the working group and discussion in plenary. And um, the training will end again with an input on gender dimension in mobility research and food for thought and we will be happy to um, also discuss with you um, about your situation, uh, your um, experiences in ing integrating gender issues in the mobility sector. And uh, at the end of our um, training, we will have a wrap up and also um, an ex ante um, evaluation. Uh, as you know, as a European project, it's always necessary to have on one hand, documentation and evaluation. So we will be very happy if you uh, could also fill out our exit questionnaire. Uh, thanks for those who have um, shared and who have also filled out the ex ante questionnaire. Uh, we have um, asked you about your expectations and um, I have um, now, well, copy paste the expectations that have been um, mentioned by the participants and um, I'm very happy that um, most of the people really um, have specific expectations uh, concerning the content. Um, how is it possible that gender can be included in uh, mobility research? Um, it, uh, we have also expectations uh, concerning um, how could gender, the gender dimension considered in mobility projects? Uh, what about um, mobility characteristics of people? So I hope that uh, with our training, we will meet your expectations. And uh, we have also um, some expectations that um, I have to admit cannot be covered and tackled with our training today. Uh, expectations such as setting up a gender equality plan or how to implement gender equality plans. So these uh, topics are not the main topic for our training today, but I would um, ask you and invite you also to have a look at our GE Academy uh, training program. We have several um, seminars, trainings, uh, support that is really dedicated to these expectations. So then um, I'm very happy that um, we have um, hopefully also uh, your results um, and your expectations covered in the training. Um, and if there are some um, additional expectations you would like to share, then um, for the expectations, I would um, ask you to use the chat box so that we can um, hopefully also tackle um, some other upcoming expectations that are not mentioned on the slide. Now, I'd like you to um, yeah, reflect your daily routines and your daily. Um, I guess um, several of you are familiar with um, how to visualize mobility patterns. And um, for the first exercise, uh, I would like you to think about um, your daily routines and your daily trips. Normally, in non-pandemic times, I would um, ask you to reflect and to think about your trips and your 
routines and um, yeah, activities you undertook yesterday. In times of the pandemic, and I'm uh, located in uh, Austria, we had um, information from our government, especially for the region uh, in Vienna, that we will have uh, another lockdown and uh, restrictions of uh, not going outside and so on and so forth. So that's why I would ask you to think about um, a typical day uh, in pre-COVID-19 time. Uh, I have um, um, did, I, I've done my PhD uh, at the Technical University in Vienna and my topic was um, yeah, working on the common travel um, survey methods and I um, did a critique from the gender perspective. So that's uh, really one of my um, yeah, topics that I've been working quite long. Uh, I don't want to go too much into detail, and I hope that I will can I will um, give you a short overview in the next couple of minutes um, how uh, the gender dimension is also embedded in the methods that are used uh, in transport planning uh, as well as sometimes in urban planning. Um, common travel survey methods. When we um, look at the um, yeah the, the topic, so um, common travel survey methods are used, um, especially in uh, town planning, urban planning, also in mobility planning. Um, on one hand, um, for the purpose of um, getting to um, know about the mobility patterns and um, providing more information. And um, uh, there is also one common approach uh, when we um, investigate different um, travel survey methods and methodologies um, all over Europe. Uh, quantitative data um, are seen as the um, one and only approach when it comes to um, travel survey methods, at least um, for on, on the national scale. And the quantitative data, they collect information uh, on the individual um, mobility patterns uh, and um, individual influencing factors such as economic, socioeconomic or demographic information. And um, mobility surveys also collect um, information concerning household circumstances. And uh, when we um, analyze different uh, travel survey methods that are carried out um, all over Europe, then um, we have to face that mainly travel surveys um, focus um, a predefined weekday. Uh, and uh, sometimes the uh, travel surveys also focus uh, the, week the weekend. And um, the travel surveys, they have also one common methodology approach. They ask for the trips that have been undertaken uh, by all household members that differs between the different uh, countries. Uh, for instance, in Germany, they also ask for um, the trips that have been undertaken by children. In Austria, they ask only for uh, people older than six years old. And um, they ask for all the trips that have been undertaken on the, a certain um, day, a predefined day. And when we have a look at um, the quantitative questionnaire, I have um, brought you here on one hand an example from uh, a travel survey that was conducted in Austria. I have um, also translated um, the, the content, so that's um, also um, then um, readable for the international audience, uh, the common travel survey methods, they ask for, um, they ask the question about the purpose. So um, what kind of purpose um, was it that you undertook the uh, certain trip? And then uh, concerning the travel um, purpose categories that are provided, um, and that is quite common um, throughout all of those uh, travel, quantitative travel surveys methods that are in place in Europe. So it's about work related, uh, work purpose, a purpose that is um, dedicated to school, education, bringing or, and picking up people 
and then, for instance, children to the school, shopping, personal businesses, for instance, uh, going to the doctors or to some authorities, leisure activities, uh, home related, and then is also the, the open field for um, an individual answer. And um, when we um, have a close look on these um, categories, travel purpose categories that are uh, provided by um, the yeah or the, by the authorities uh, who um, commission and who um, conduct these um, travel surveys, then uh, it becomes quite clear that from the gender perspective, there are several critique. Um, needed and it can be formulated that uh, only for instance paid work is um, mentioned with several uh, travel purposes and um, other uh, purposes for instance um, egg combining people are really missing it's just picking up and bringing people to a different place um, as for the results um, I have now uh, um, brought uh, with you with me the results from uh, the Austrian uh, travel survey that was conducted uh, in the year 2013 to 2014. That's uh, for Austria. The, these are the recent data we have, and uh, you can see also as it was pointed out in the video that um, there are um, differences between men and women uh, concerning their travel purposes and um, focusing the red, the dark red and the pink um, bars in, in the column, you can see that um, the purpose uh, job related and going to work is uh, the one that is um, the, the share of male with that travel purpose is higher than uh, the share as for women. Whereas uh, when we look at the um, dark blue, um, bar in the column that's uh, the travel purpose for shopping then we have um, a bigger share uh, of that travel purpose when we look at female than uh, at males and um, when we um, conduct um, travel surveys not only from the quantitative perspective but also from a qualitative perspective so asking people um, how did they undertake their trips what about their daily routines then uh, it occurs that um, the trips that are undertaken especially by people who have uh, caring responsibilities um, the trips are quite diverse and I have also brought um, a figure with me so that uh, really shows and um, we will be working on your travel uh, patterns later. So then um, we will also might uh, face that uh, some of those travel uh, patterns that uh, reflect your own individ individual mobility maybe are uh, more diverse and have several trips and um, several stops and using different modes of transportation. Uh, when we look back at the quantitative um, questionnaire uh, and rethink uh, these um, quantitative questionnaire and th those predefined uh, travel purposes, uh, it quite uh, it becomes really obvious that, um, especially for people with caring responsibilities, these uh, purposes do not fit proper properly. Uh, for instance, uh, when we think about um, a trip that um, a 32-year-old father with two children undertakes, for instance, uh, in, in the afternoon, so when uh, he walks with his um, two kids um, to the playground and then um, doing some, some shopping um, issues and going to a pharmacy, going to a bakery, and then, um, for instance, also buying some food for the kids, uh, going to the grocery shop and back home. Um, then it's really uh, the question, which box should that father tick for his trip that he undertakes. So um, maybe is it work because maybe he is in uh, paternity leave and then he will uh, also uh, get paid for his um, being at home with the, with the kids or is it um, 
bringing and picking up the kids that would not be the uh, correct purpose because uh, he has to accompany uh, his children. Um, only um, le leisure activities, then it's the question, is it really a leisure activity when he um, has caring responsibilities? So I hope with that example, it really um, becomes clear that uh, these quantitative um, travel survey methods, they really um, do not um, visualize and do not um, provide um, the proper data that is needed for um, having uh, a bit a better uh, base of knowledge concerning gender issues in mobility. And um, I think it also uh, is quite clear that um, categories, they, um, especially when it comes to the travel purposes, that they reflect current gender stereotypes and cliches. Uh, trips related to purposes such as um, unpaid housework and caring responsibilities, um, especially for children and the elderly, uh, remain unvisible. And when we um, also have a close look on the travel survey uh, methods, when it comes to which trips are reported, um, uh, there is also evidence that um, short trips that are mainly undertaken um, by walking, that they uh, remain under-reported. Under so that uh, we really, when it uh, also comes to counting how many trips did people undertake on a certain day, then um, it's um, also obvious that, for instance, short trips are under um, reported. And in that sense, uh, we have also to face that um, town planning, urban planning and mobility planning, they really have a lack of data. Uh, and that brings me also to the gender dimension in research, because um, when we have um, a close look on um, the, uh, let's call it some gender in research ladder that was developed by uh, Londa Schiebinger, she um, clearly points out that it's uh, necessary to rethink the uh, research and development process really from the very beginning. So it's unnecessary to reflect uh, on the assumptions, on the theories, on the concepts, also on the hypothesis and methodologies. And I think um, the um, critique uh, on the tra um, common travel survey methods uh, really is an example that uh, we also have to rethink about the methods and the methodology that is used for instance, when we want to investigate uh, the mobility patterns of certain user groups or of certain people. Um, I want uh, to present some um, of my research and uh, some findings. Um, and um, in connection with the quantitative um, travel survey uh, that I mentioned before that was conducted in, in Austria uh, in, during the time period of 2013 and 2014. Um, I'm very happy that my company um, get a, got a contract um, from the ministry and they asked us uh, to also focus on um, the mobility issues and mobility patterns of people with caring resp responsibilities. So that was uh, really a, a very um, yeah, interesting work, interesting piece of research. We had the a possibility to conduct over 130 face-to-face -face interviews uh, in different areas in Austria. And uh, the aim was not only focusing Vienna as um, a big capital, as, as a, the capital of Austria, uh, with um, uh, yeah, uh, quite um, well equipped um, transport services with underground and buses and so on. So we uh, had also the opportunity to have a close um, look at rural areas, and um, that was um, really very interesting. And uh, we focused on um, the mobility patterns, mobility needs of people who have caring responsibilities and who um, are responsible for accompanying um, children or the elderly. 
and uh, we developed um, based on our results several criteria that are uh, quite characteristic for um, people who have who undertake um, trips together with other people, especially with children. So, um, and I have uh, brought some statements from our interviews. So on one hand, uh, combining trips, um, they are characteristic, char characterized by um, um, yeah, a huge responsibility. And one interview partner stated, as long as the kids sit in the ba baby carriage, you can handle the situation. But when they start walking on their own, approximately at the age of three, you bear a greater responsibility. You have to keep your eyes on the kids and look after them so that nothing happens. For me, that's the big difference. Um, with that statement, uh, we really, um, and those people who have or had caring responsibilities for children, they know what I'm talking about. Uh, so when, when you are um, undertake your trips with children, then you really have to care for them uh, during the, the whole trip and also beyond. Uh, steadiness and flexibility, uh, that's also one of the characteristics for a combining trips uh, and uh, our interview partners, they stated that these are two counterparts. On one hand, we have got a well-structured agenda of the week and well-organized work days. Um, I think that is also familiar for those who um, have caring responsibility and um, a paid job or working responsibilities uh, and it's also said that on the other hand you have to keep flexible uh, time is also considered as really a determining factor uh, and the time that is not only uh, the own agenda, uh, the work-related agenda, but also uh, the, for instance, the school timetables of the kids. And I think that especially now um, in the pandemic, uh, that would be uh, also needed to further investigate what um, are the impacts of um, homeschooling and distance learning, and um, what the, uh, are these impacts uh, on the daily mobility patterns of people with caring responsibilities. And especially uh, when it comes to um, caring responsibilities for impaired person, then the needs of the egg combined uh, people get more and more important. So uh, these needs are more important than for instance, um, own mobility needs. So with the next uh, slide, I have uh, also um, brought to, uh, with me um, a visualization of uh, caring, caregiving responsibilities, uh, which causes uh, complex trip chains. Uh, we tried to visualize here also what are the influencing factors that lead to the fact that um, trip chains, chains become more and more complex. So it has something to do with um, how many people are a combined, what about the waiting time, for instance, and in public transport systems, what about the difficulties of the terrain and um, other influencing factors. And um, as I mentioned before, uh, time constraints are uh, also one characteristic of people with caring responsibilities. Um, and with that visualization, I, I want also to highlight that um, the um, mobility patterns of people with caring responsibilities are always um, in the, um, yeah, they have to organize their own schedule, the schedule of uh, the school children, for instance, and uh, if people um, have not the possibility of riding their own car, or if people um, don't have, for instance, a driving license or not uh, the um, economic uh, background, then and, and they, or maybe if they want from a sustainable perspective, use the public transport, then also the timetable and uh, for buses is uh, something that have uh, to be considered. 
and um, a situation that you uh, might know. Uh, I don't know exactly if it's uh, the case in, in other countries in Austria schools, um, especially the primary schools, they start at around um, quarter to eight or eight o'clock in the morning. So um, the situation in front of a school uh, at 7.30 a.m. in the morning, that is um, all, um, something that is quite crowded. And I'm pretty sure that you all are familiar with um, yeah, parents um, picking and, and bringing their kids with uh, their own car to the school. On the other hand, it's uh, also quite important to uh, emphasize active mobility, um, especially for the younger ones. And um, we have also here some um, yeah, contradictory approaches. And um, it's necessary when it comes to implementing gender and mobility issues uh, in town planning and also in urban planning that we um, consider also the uh, dilemma that was mentioned also in the video with the short-term measures and long-term measures. Um, I have now with the, uh, a few more slides I would like to share with you. And these uh, slides should uh, really uh, be the basis for a joint discussion. Um, and as for the joint discussion, we have um, again prepared um, a Google document that we would like to share with um, all of you so that we can really co-work on the um, Google document. And um, our aim would be uh, with based on the um, discussion and, and on the exercises you have conducted so far and with the um, input from our side that uh, we really work uh, along the next steps. So what would it, what would be the next steps to integrate um, gender perspectives and gender dimensions in mobility? And as for some food for thought, I would um, again would like to present some of um, my work that I have been conducting and working on in the last um, few years. But let me now first of all start with some um, reflection questions and um, how it, would it be possible to integrate the uh, gender dimension in mobility research. So on one hand, it's um, quite important that we um, have a close look on the current body of literature regarding the gender dimension in mobility and transportation. And when we compare the different um, disciplines and topical fields, in the STEM field in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, then um, it's quite obvious that um, related to architecture, urban planning, and also mobility issues, uh, we really have a, um, a huge or a vast body of literature. And um, it's necessary that we have a close um, desk research and that we also uh, take the so-called gray literature into account. Um, I would also like to uh, point out that uh, under the Chico project, um, not only the uh, YouTube video uh, we have shared earlier with you has been developed, but also uh, quite a quite comprehensive literature review on uh, gender dimension in mobility research. And we will share uh, that uh, resource with you also on the slides respectively. We can also share it uh, in the chat. It's uh, publicly available. So it's really important that we um, have a close look about uh, the state of the art and state of knowledge, state of play. And um, next quite important question is then really how is it possible to integrate the gender perspective in one's research proposal, for instance, or in a project? And um, from and that is also something we would like to uh, further work on uh, in the, uh, the next um, exercise. How is it possible really to integrate the gender dimension? So it could be on one hand, um, something to do with awareness raising measures so that uh, we really talk about the gender dimension in uh, research, especially in mobility research, that we develop specific research questions. I will um, I'll present you some 
um, examples on that. So for instance, to focus on a specific vulnerable uh, to exclusion user group, to uh, be interested in the mobility patterns of specific um, users of specific uh, groups of people. So that uh, is also something where we uh, can include the gender dimension um, in the case when we really um, take a close in-depth perspective. Using and applying participatory methods, that's uh, all, also one recommendation coming from the gender in research um, approach. Um, participatory methods uh, that also focus on vulnerable uh, users groups um, may lead to more qualitative and more robust results. And um, when it comes really to uh, mobility solutions or really to uh, concrete measures, such as, for instance, um, new um, mobility solutions, uh, for instance, in the rural areas, um, such as buses on demand, for instance, um, or all those uh, technologies that are now under development when it comes to automotive uh, mobility. Uh, it's uh, quite useful or it should be recommended and it should be uh, um, taken into account uh, what would be the impact of different mobility solutions for different um, user groups, for instance. Uh, and then uh, it's also quite important to take uh, the diversity dimension. So for instance, um, um, capability and um, uh, physical impairments into account so that we uh, really uh, try to um, have an impact analysis based on different and diverse user groups so that we really overcome that stereotype that is um, still quite common in, in mobility and in transport um, research and in mobility and transport solutions that it um, seems that uh, it's only healthy adult people using, for instance, mobility solutions, but that's not the case. We know that our um, world and uh, all people around are more than um, just uh, a stereotype white grown up adult. And uh, it's also um, necessary to uh, really to include uh, different um, and, and diverse um, people or research subjects in, in your research or in your uh, projects and in terms of diverse, in terms of age, <clears throat> disabilities or abilities, uh, ethnicity, ethnicity and so on. And as I mentioned before, under the perspective of the impact assessment, then it's um, quite important to um, ask the question and to find answers to uh, two very important questions. So who would benefit how from your results? Um, for instance, mobility solutions, and are your results um, or your mobility solutions accessible and affordable for various users groups? So I think these two um, questions, uh, they should really be some guiding questions uh, throughout all mobility research projects or approaches. Uh, and let me now um, show you um, a few examples from my uh, research. So uh, uh, we, um, in the last few years, we carried out uh, several research projects um, highlighting the mobility patterns of, um, well, a user group that is um, sometimes forgetting themselves and they are forgotten. So we had, um, we carried out several research uh, projects uh, focusing mobility patterns of people with dementia and their needs. So what is really needed from, uh, from the perspective of people with um, dementia. And uh, one can sum up that uh, dementia friendly planning um, is um, a combination of uh, barrier free planning plus focusing the cognitive dimension. So that is um, also something where we um, quite often when it comes really to to concrete uh, solutions, we uh, face a dilemma. So uh, because uh, planning is always embedded in, in, in different, um, yeah, um, 
political, uh, let's put it that way, political approaches. And um, quite often we have to find um, the, a good uh, solution and we have to deal with different um, requirements that come from different um, yeah, political fields, such as uh, on, on one hand, um, the, the focus really that uh, people with dementia are supported. Uh, and when we propose that um, it would maybe also lead to the uh, fact that we should uh, reconsider about, uh, for instance, advertisements in public sphere than um, other uh, fields of, of politics um, and the economic perspective, they point out that it's uh, quite uh, it's not possible to reduce, for instance, advertisements, uh, and, and that would be uh, a good solution for people with, with um, dementia, really to reduce the uh, cognitive stimuli uh, in public spaces and to have uh, the public spaces really uh, well organized. And that is um, sometimes we have really a discrepancy between different um, approaches. Um, and uh, when it comes uh, to people with, um, for instance, for um, especially with caring responsibility and people in the rural area, then it's uh, quite necessary also from a sustainable development perspective to focus on um, multimodal transport systems. Um, and um, as for the rural area, and it's uh, quite important to consider about the first and the last mile and to provide also mobility solutions that are on, on one hand more um, based on uh, on demand services. Um, and the rural area is, is really, uh, especially in, in, in Austria, and uh, really a, a big issue. Uh, we have to uh, also um, think about uh, mobility solutions that go hand in hand also with uh, regional planning decisions. Um, when we look at um, the ticketing, um, then at least uh, in the German speaking countries, we have the, the fact that um, the ticketing, um, when it comes, for instance, for to tickets uh, that are available for um, a month, monthly tickets or weekly tickets, then these um, tickets are more suitable for people uh, who have a full-time employment and uh, it is lacking um, a specific equivalent for people who have part-time um, job, um, jobs. And when they do not use the public transport every day, then um, specific uh, ticketing systems and ticketing offers are missing. And I think that could also be an approach where we could uh, think about bringing in the gender perspective in the ticketing system. And that maybe would lead also to uh, better mobility solutions for different people. Uh, we have mentioned also uh, the, um, facts that uh, so concerning with um, raising the quality in the means of transport, such as um, comfort of buses, increasing the comfort of buses, trams, bike lanes, and so on. And we have also uh, discussed a little bit about barrier-free vehicle stations. And uh, we haven't, uh, shall not forget that uh, mobility is not only about vehicles and stations and um, the technical facility. Um, mobility is also about information. So are the transport um, and um, mobility relevant information, is it really accessible for all people? So that's also something uh, we should um, consider and take into account. And um, with my last slide for us, uh, food for thought, I would like to highlight uh, the fact of improving active mobility. So that is uh, really something um, that is mostly important for uh, people with uh, caring responsibilities that we also um, think about walking and cycling uh, facilities uh, that are uh, specially dedicated um, for the mobility um, patterns and mobility needs of children. 
um, and that um, to bring in, in that um, case more sustainable mobility solutions would also need um, to um, maybe change also the legislation. So is it uh, from which uh, age on are children allowed to ride their bike? Um, on the road or on the pedestrian lane and um, here we can also um, see that um, mobility is really an interlinked topic so it's not only about um, the well the pavements and but it's also about uh, re legislation it's about regulation and it's um, really most important about the people and uh, knowing about the needs of different and diverse people and their uh, spe specific requirements they have uh, towards mobility. Bente, maybe I could start just giving an example from my experience. Yes. While people are uh, hopefully opening the Google document yeah. and reading through the, the word. So as I said earlier, I am more of a gender and development specialist. So gender is always trying to be uh, integrated everywhere. But I have had an experience with uh, writing a concept note for a research proposal with an international organization a few years ago about mobility. So they were um, actually, it was in Santiago de Chile. They were uh, studying mobility based on data from a mobile phone provider. So it was something a bit innovative, new, I guess. And they hadn't really taken into consideration the gender dimension appropriately. So uh, my role there was uh, as, as a gender expert of supporting the integration of the gender perspective in this research proposal in the concept note. So if we are going back to this document that we are sharing and looking at the various field of actions that can be possible to integrate gender into a research proposal or a project, um, I would say that in my case, in my experience, we try to consider gender related literature and expertise. And at the same time, we went back to the research questions and we tried to formulate specific research questions that could take into consideration the gender dimension as well. So um, as it refers to this project, this would have been my, uh, my experience. We were not able to use participatory methods or we were not so advanced as to include a diverse group of, um, of, of, uh, of researchers at least, uh, but we did apply a few of these strategies. So I just thought I would share that. Also uh, right now finalizing a study that was commissioned by the Austrian um, Ministry of um, uh, Transport and, and, and Climate Change and so on, uh, dealing with um, automotive mobility and inclusion. And we, uh, our job was also to, um, come up with uh, precise recommendations how uh, the inclusion perspective can be embedded and implemented when it comes to those future technologies line that it is really important to uh, include more dimensions than only gender so uh, especially the um, perspective of um, disabilities and abilities is quite important uh, it's also when it comes to inclusion, it's also important uh, that we consider uh, different um, yeah, senses so that uh, we, we faced in, in our uh, project when we um, had also workshops with um, people with disabilities that, uh, for instance, deaf, deaf person, uh, who, people who can't hear, uh, that they uh, quite often or normally they avoid using an um, elevator, uh, because that elevator, uh, mainly they don't have um, the facility of uh, video connection, and it's only an audio connection. And when people who can't hear get in an emergency, emergency situation, then they can't communicate with other people. And, and that is also something that we have to take into account when it comes to safety uh, issues. And uh, so it's... it's uh, Safety has really uh, is, is an important issue for all. And 
Well, in, in fact, um, I think it's important uh, to have a, a close focus on, on um, specific vulnerable to exclusion groups or marginalized groups. So, uh, and when we uh, conducted our uh, work with um, our research on uh, people with dementia, it was uh, really crucial to have uh, good door openers and really uh, get in contact with people with dementia. And uh, we as uh, researchers, we also, uh, um, had specific trainings and, and um, uh, yeah, uh, workshops on how to communicate with people with dementia. So that's, that's really something uh, that uh, was uh, also quite, yeah, successful because it was really an, uh, on a personal level, a, a, a huge enrichment um, working with people with dementia. And then it also, we had uh, um, three different, um, pieces or, or approaches to conduct the research. On one hand, um, narrative interviews, uh, going back in, in, in the little bit using oral history methods. So really asking about the biography and what kind of, uh, well, or what, what importance uh, did mobility or driving a car, for instance, have for the different people? And then uh, we ask them also to join us uh, to a combined walks. And uh, so that was also something where uh, the people had the well possibility in, in, in for those people who lived in caring um, homes that they um, could decide where to go and we, we walked to different parks with, with the people so that was also uh, quite quite nice and the third part was and we did not uh, succeed in that <laughs> was we wanted to um, uh, conduct usability tests uh, with um, mobility um, supporting tools and for uh, especially some um, smart watches and technical devices that have been uh, developed, especially for people with dementia, but uh, our target group, they kind of kind of refused um, working with these uh, technical equipment. So we had to change our approach a little bit, but that is also something that happens when you work in a participatory manner, you have to be flexible also as a researcher and then uh, reformulate your uh, research questions a little bit. But I think the door opener that, that that's, and, and I would uh, also think uh, uh, that it's, really important to uh, focus on specific groups really in in depth and that is uh, also something that we have to discuss all the time in the uh, in the stem field that uh, qualitative approaches in research are um, as important as quantitative data collection from my perspective um, uh, also the strategy of uh, gender mainstreaming um, and gender budgeting might be um, a good starting point because when it comes to the distribution of uh, public money and we have to consider that um, mainly mobility solutions uh, are built or are uh, constructed and are financed by public money, then um, I think it's also a, a question of justice that uh, the public money uh, is equally and fair distributed among various user groups. And I think that um, should be also a relevant um, perspective when it comes to planning decisions. So who is really, uh, who are the ones who benefit from a specific solution and who does not benefit and it also has something to do with um, applied research so we discussed about uh, the automotive mobility um, a couple of minutes ago and um, there are lots of um, yeah yeah a huge amount of, of uh, money that is spent in in that specific um, field of um, research and um, I think the question is um, should be really tackled um, right at the beginning of the research so who, who is uh, who are the ones who benefit and who, who will not benefit so what is needed that, that the results really are accessible and affordable for 
different user groups and that would also lead to the um, to the recommendation really to include various user groups in a participatory manner really from the beginning on of, of your research and of um, projects. <clears throat> 